You're listening to Homeschool Unrefined. I'm Marin, And I'm Angela. Let's encourage each other, laugh, and get real about homeschool. Welcome to the podcast where we keep homeschool simple, real, and fun. You've got episode 78, Nature Series, How to Raise a Wild Child, chapters 1 and 2. Hi, friends. Welcome to Homeschool Unrefined. We're so glad you're here. Uh, We just wanted to let you know that we are going to be here all summer um, with episodes every week. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And we are doing every other week, we're going to be talking about how to raise a wild child um, and nature. So you could follow along with us. You could get the book. You don't have to. Right. Um, Yeah. Yep. No pressure to get the book, but um, it's a good one. And uh, we're going to be doing that every other week. And then on the other weeks, we're just going to talk about what's going well, what we need to tweak. We're going to be checking in on self-care and we're going to be answering a listener question. Right. So if you have a question, let us know. If you have, uh, you know, just send us a DM or anything like that. We'd love to hear any questions that you'd love for us to talk about this summer. Yep. And we just wanted to thank our Patreon supporters for supporting our show. If you are interested in becoming a supporter, you can go to patreon.com slash homeschool unrefined and you can get extra episodes. Yes. And we so appreciate the support that we've gotten. It's been amazing. So it has. It has kind of blown us away. Yeah. Yep. So thank you. So, Marin, yeah. um, I have not talked to you since you returned from dropping your daughter off at camp. I know. And I'd love to hear about that because it was her first, well, your first and her first like overnight camp I know. experience. I know. It was, uh, I think we were both really nervous about it, but both okay. really excited at the same yeah. time. Um, you know, my oldest daughter is, <laughs> I, I posted about this <laughs> on Instagram, but she is so, <sighs> I, I mean, it's hard to describe her. She's so independent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and needs so much freedom uh, in so many ways. And so I I don't know that I ever had on my radar that I'd be sending kids to camp ever. Like, I just mm-hmm. never thought that would be a big deal. But as she's been growing, growing, I've been just thinking, it's just come to my mind a few times. I think this would be really good for her. Right. <laughs> It'd be such a good experience. She needs time away from her younger siblings. She needs to explore new things all the time (laughs) and she just the new is better for her always and so it was just a good a good plan I mean it was just a good fit for her this camp so but you had to drive kind of far away yeah I mean it's kind of far yeah 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 although Mm -hmm. you know it didn't it doesn't feel uh a scary far distance I mean we you know my parents this is northern Minnesota my parents have a cabin near there I spent all of my well, you know, so much of my childhood up in northern Minnesota, and subsequently, my kids have spent a lot of time up in northern Minnesota yep. at their grandparents' cabin. So it's very close to them. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't feel, you know, um, it doesn't, you know, when you're when you're away at camp for the first time, it, I feel like it'd be scary if it were far away. Yeah. This is not doesn't feel far away. Okay. I don't, I don't think. I mean, to me, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I think that I think it helped her feel better too. And how um, does your house feel without her? You know, um, it is it's a nice dynamic. I th- I have always found that when one kid is gone, it changes the dyna- dynamics of, of the whole family, yeah. and it's a good change. We spend so much time together, yeah. <laughs> the six of us, <laughs> yeah, so much time, and I think that's good to a point. And then it's healthy to have a change in that right uh so it it's been a good change it's been a good change for all of us you know that's so healthy of you to say the twins are twins who are nine you know they get a chance to be the oldest in the family and our youngest has one less person telling her what to do right and so and there's just like a little more space and um one less person talking (laughs) <laughs> there's always so many people talking in our house yeah oh yeah. my goodness so yeah uh it's been it's been a good change so yeah, yeah that's it was great. hard to, it was kind of hard to say goodbye to her uh, I will admit although I was thinking it was going to be harder okay I was worried that I was going to be really sad about it but uh she was so excited that's so great yeah she's up there without 
anybody she knows. Right. I mean, she doesn't have, yeah. she didn't go yeah. with a friend. Right. Okay. Yeah. Which I think, I mean, again, I think is kind of good for her. She, yeah. she, uh, kind of thrives in that kind of environment. Yeah. That's awesome. Way to go. I know. I, yeah, I think it's great. She's braver than I pr- was at that age. Yeah, for sure. Right. I would not have done that. Yeah. So crazy. Um, and you, you can email her or send her messages. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's how you communicate. <laughs> right. Good. And I, I did send her, I did send along some stationery and stamps for her, but she was already telling me as you know, before we left, <laughs> she's like, I don't think I'm going to get to this. <laughs> <laughs> so it's fine <laughs> oh that's fun yeah that is fun well good for you yeah thank you I know <laughs> it's, I feel really <laughs> proud of myself you should because <laughs> actually I haven't sent my kids to an overnight camp my oldest go, went to like a youth group oh yeah yeah weekend thing just for the weekend mm-hmm. like Friday Saturday Sunday last year and she was well, she was 12 mm-hmm. <laughs> going into seventh grade. That was really hard for me. I don't know was why. Was it really hard? It was really hard for me. Now she went again this year and it wasn't as hard. I okay. was just like, okay, have fun. But I don't like her being gone. I feel like it just doesn't feel right in our household. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm sad about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is like the difference between you and I. Yeah, it is different. <laughs> you and I are different. I mean, I, f- I do feel sad. I mean, I feel sad. I know, yeah. But I also, I think, more feel Happy excited, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's just, I think I just because, uh, I mean, I know Esther too. I just know what that it's, it's so good for her. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, that's um, great. Yeah. Today we are talking about the book How to Raise a Wild Child by Scott Sampson. Mm-hmm. The first two chapters... Um, which we are really excited about. We've been wanting to read this book for a while. I know. Yeah. It's been on my list for sure. Yeah. Um, Amber was on our podcast a while back. Yeah. Books we're reading. Sh- books we're reading. Yeah. And she suggested it. And it always stuck with me that her recommendation was so strong that I was like, I really need to be reading this. Right. So, so, um, I've been wanting to read it since then and since it's summer and I really need to, we're kind of digging into nature over here. It's real. It's a great time to dig into nature. It's a great time. Like I feel renewed because of the changing of the seasons. Right. And I feel like there's something happens in the summer where we give ourselves permission to, you know, take the time, take the time. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think we, uh, I mean, I I shouldn't say all of us. We don't all do this. I do this. Um, Like I think during the school year, I feel I can let myself think um, that academics are more important. Mm-hmm. We got to get to those things, mm-hmm. and we there's a place for nature in the academic you know season, um, but it's can't you know we have to stick to these things. And then I feel like in the summer I can be like nature all the time. Somehow yeah. it's it's okay. Right. I know. <laughs> but, I know. I. Yeah. As I'm reading this, I'm thinking, I got to change that mentality. I, think, I know. Too. Yeah. So we, you know, you do not have to read this book to follow along with us because we're basically just going to be talking about nature. Yeah, so exactly. That's, exactly. So that's the good news. <laughs> the other thing, though, I do want to say is after I, I actually listened to this on Audible and then I also have the book, which I then went back and like underlined key things that I remember. Mm-hmm that I liked. Um, as I was listening on Audible, I just felt even to the even to the introduction, I was yeah. so inspired. Yeah. It was just like it like you said, I was like, wow, I have got to make this a priority more than I am making it right now. Yeah. I I have got to I just was so inspired by him and by his message <laughs> that I think you should not should. I don't think anybody should read the book. But I think if you're interested in reading yeah. the book. Yes. It would be a good idea because it's inspiring and motivating. Okay. I'm going to admit that when I started listening to it, I was like, uh, I feel like this is a little preachy and oh, really? mm. I already know this stuff and don't tell wow. me, what, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Uh, yeah. That's how I felt. And I think I just, I think I went into it with this preconceived idea that I was like, I don't feel like I need to read another nature book. 
Interesting. Because <laughs> you wanted to read it. I did. Well, I did. I wanted to read it, and yet I felt like I'm not going to learn anything. I just that's just my idea. Mm. That's just what I thought. Mm. And I think okay. that the, my first go through was because I I've I listened to it a few times actually. The first time I was like, eh, I don't know. It was okay, but now uh, I listened again, <laughs> and this is just how I do it. I listen. I listened and went through the book visually at the same time yeah and underlined stuff um and that was so much better for me yeah and I it may have been because of the combination of the two things that I did you know like listening and looking at the same time or just the second time around I just felt like okay I I'm more into it now I'm more into it (laughs) yeah yeah so. I did feel I felt very inspired right away but I did go through and re-underline things and I feel like I must have missed a lot when I was listening because yes. I found all these great things right. that I kind of missed the first time around and it made me think what else do I miss when I'm listening to audiobooks <laughs> I know hmm. <laughs> I know and that's exactly how I felt too in fact we were going to record this earlier and I had just listened to it and I was like mm-hmm. I don't feel like I have anything to say yeah <laughs> I don't have anything to say <laughs> Um, and then we, so we decided not to record. <laughs> wow. So we are, been, we are getting it, real here. Otherwise it would have been just you talking. Uh, <laughs> and then the, but now I feel like I have so much more to say. Oh yeah. And there are so many details in this book that are so good. Yeah. I feel like the overarching message is great. And then yes. if you, if you want it, there are some things, the practical details that can help you. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then I'll just say one more thing that I'm a little bit leery of. And okay, then we're going to wow. move on to all the things we love. But um, <laughs> I am a little bit leery that he is, you know, he's, he talked about this a lot. He's like, I'm a baby boomer. <laughs> That's what he said, you know, oh, a few times. Okay. okay. Which I can't believe he's a baby I miss boomer. that. Yeah. I miss he- that. Wow. Okay. <laughs> it surprises me that he's that old though. It doesn't oh, seem that like- old. Yeah. You think baby boomers are that old. Okay. I do. Uh, okay. Um, this is the guy from Dinosaur Train, everyone. You know, <laughs> the paleontologist. Yeah, he's a pale- he's a paleontologist. That's his, um, you know, background. Yeah. So, are you if you've watched PBS Kids lately, you've seen him. Um, but <laughs> he, but he also, so he talks about how that generation is just. I don't know. You know how that <laughs> I feel like, <laughs> like older people are like our generation just we did it right, and oh. this new generation they don't appreciate nature as much as you know, we do or whatever. So I did feel a little bit of that kind of tone mm, in there. You did. I did. I did not feel like that. Oh, yeah. I I felt like he was like, the changes that have happened are inevitable. You know, it's the result of, I, I didn't feel like he was placing blame on any one I generation. don't think he was placing blame. I never thought that, but I did feel like he was saying it, things are going downhill. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't that. know that I'd necessarily agree with that. Oh, really? Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh. This is interesting. <laughs> thought you'd agree. I thought you'd agree with me on this. I, that things aren't going downhill nature-wise? Oh, uh, gosh. No, just our... Society, I mean, culture. Yeah, just, you know... Oh. Like, technical technology wise is ruining everything that's how I feel is what I'm saying and I'm saying what I and it'll be interesting because I know he's going to talk in later chapters about it about how we can work together I just really like like I I I keep going back to our um talk with Julie Bogart and how she was talking about technology Mm -hmm. and she's like we need to shake hands with technology (laughs) you know and be like I'm not afraid of you we are let's work together on this and I am hoping that he's going there Yep. But I haven't seen that yet. I haven't heard okay, that yes. yet. Okay, I do agree with you. I don't think technology is making our society go downhill. Right. I think we need to have a more positive outlook about technology. Right. I do and, think and just work together more. Yeah. Yeah, I do think we are spending less time in nature. Mm. I do agree with that too. And that is true. That's facts. And, yeah, and that is the part that I think ugh, we've right. kind of really come away from that. Right. And it may be in part to technology. So, oh yeah you're right you know they so. yep I do agree with that I think that's yeah. so true and I think that's probably what he was just trying to say oh yeah but it, I just felt like a little like hmm, hmm. 
Hmm. I don't know. I, yeah, yeah. I, it'll just be interesting how it all plays out in the rest of the book. So, yeah. Okay. Well, <sighs> he did talk about in the introduction, a cup, he has three goals. And one of them we just talked about mm-hmm. was to ring the alarm bell. Right. <laughs> About our about our disconnect from nature. So yeah. I think he's he's sort of set the stage for that. Right. Yep. And that was convincing to me. Yeah. Um. He also wants to explore the process of nature connection. Like, how do we connect with nature? Right. And and like and he says in the next maybe it was chapter two where he was like, this is where the alarm bell should go. You know, kind of should go next. The alarm bell rings for you, and then to get back to the state of that we're supposed to be in, you know, in our relationship with nature is we need to get out in it. Yeah. Um, you can't just appreciate nature, mm. have a love mm-hmm. for nature if you're not spending time. In yeah. It, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which I really appreciated that. I thought that yeah. was so good. Yeah. 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 And then his other goal is trying to help, parents and educators become nature mentors for kids oh my gosh I really loved that term yes and that is a great way to frame it for me yes and can we just talk about that for a second sure (laughs) because I know it's in chapter two and I'm just going all over the place here yeah okay um but I loved how he described being a mentor yeah um and he was talking about how it's uh, I'm just gonna read a little part here sure um It turns out to be far more effective to engage in playful side-by-side exploration Mm -hmm. as a mentor. Accomplished mentors listen more than they talk. Oh, yeah. Yes. I think I underlined that part, too. Yes. They model key behavior. Oh, I did underline it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So good. I know. I they observe that. closely, yeah. inspire curiosity, and pull stories from their mentees by asking questions that gently push the limits of awareness and knowledge. Yeah. So it's not, he said, we, you should not think of yourself as like this teacher who's like imparting nature knowledge. Yeah, that just kills everything. Don't do that. <laughs> I mean, I've done that before. And then, you know, that's where the eyes just glaze over. Everybody's eyes just glaze over and they're like, oh my gosh. Oh, that's funny. I felt bad that I don't do that enough. Like... I don't really know enough about these trees to tell them like what kind they are, but it's not really, it's not about that. It's good. It's freeing to hear that. It's not about that. It's about asking them questions, listening, discovering together. Yep. I actually just circled or boxed this whole, that whole paragraph. (laughs) So let me just read the rest of you guys. Cause this is also good. Um, Okay. You got this that far. Being an effective mentor means becoming a co-conspirator. Mm -hmm. A fellow explorer, a chaser of clues. It means allowing plenty of unstructured time, engaging kids in activities focused more on imaginative play than digesting information. Yeah. (sighs) So good. That is how probably all learning should be more. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Not just nature. No, no. All the things that you're trying to. Right. Right. In an quote ideal unquote, world. teach. Yes. In your homeschool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So really, you know, we have to wrap our mind around teaching in a completely different way than right. we think of right. teaching. We think right. imparting knowledge. Right. <sighs> yeah. And I, he talked a lot about mentoring, but it sounds like he's going to talk more about it in chapter three. So mm-hmm. I guess we'll, Can't we'll wait. get even more. I cannot <laughs> wait. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so should we, uh, did you have anything else that you wanted to talk about in the introduction or should we move on to you know, chapter one? There was just one really cool, I really liked, I really liked this quote that was in the introduction um, by Albert Einstein okay. and he said, the significant problems we have cannot be solved at the same level of thinking with which we created them. Mm-hmm. And I love that because, I mean, if we want to solve uh, you know, this problem that, you know, people aren't in nature and, um, you know, we're not, we're not taking care of our world and things like that. We can't, um, continue to do the same things we're already doing. And we have to start thinking in a different way. Yeah. To start thinking outside the box really, or, you know, we just have to, right. We have to go a different direction. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I like that too. Yeah. I love that. 
Okay, well, chapter one is called Wilding the Mind. What is nature and do we really need it? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So, and I learned a few things, yeah. which I didn't think I would because I'm like, what is nature? Hmm, I, I think I think, I, think I, know. I know that. <laughs> yeah. See, um, you were thinking the same thing I was. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I think I know that, yep. but I didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was really helpful for me to hear him divide nature into three different categories. Yes. Um, wild, domestic, and technological. Yep. Um, okay. So wild is like the wilderness. That would be places like Yellowstone or Yosemite or something really, you know, mostly untouched. Right, right. Um, It's it's not surrounded. It's not like a small patch of wild surrounded by an urban setting or something. Right, right. So domestic is like your parks in your neighborhood or your backyard Mm -hmm. or even your dog or... um, nature spaces that you're creating yeah or even like a plant in your house could be right domestic. right yep yep go ahead and so okay i think he calls it refers to nature under human control so if you right. humans are yeah. controlling that nature that's domestic it's a good way to describe it yep and then technological nature um could be like paintings of nature or a nature show on yep. TV right. or a documentary, thing- yeah, yeah, like that. things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was helpful to me because you know I can tend to think nature is like I want I like my goal is to make it as wild as possible. You know, like sure. I think that's the epitome or whatever. Right, right. But it was helpful to hear those distinguish those char- those right. categories, yeah, so that I can know what I'm doing when I'm doing it. And now to me, it sounded like really that is the goal is to, um, to get into the wild. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, he, I think he would kind of, was kind of saying that's really important. Yeah, that's important. But I really like how he also said he, you should think of it like kind of like the food pyramid, like a nature Mm -hmm. pyramid Mm -hmm. where the really wild things like going to Yellowstone is at the top of the food pyramid and you do that every once in a while. Right. But the bulk of your nature experiences are going to be domestic. Right. And I did love how though, I know he said in here, um, and this is why getting out into the real wild is important. Like he was saying um, in this section called, do we need nature? Okay. One thing he said was the unspoken, our unspoken message, um, you know, in our society is that nature is something to be controlled and subdued. Mm. Mm. And really, I think he's trying to say in these chapters that we can't, we can't, we shouldn't always be trying to control nature. Yeah. yeah. Like, let's be part of nature without being the one who's controlling it all. Like, just be part of it. Right. Be in the system. Right. The nature system. Right. And I just, I loved that idea. I love the idea of, um, I don't know, there's something very freeing about not being the one in control of, you know, mowing your lawn or something, mm. you know, like being in yeah. a place where that's not part of the equation. Yeah. I just think there's very few truly wild areas left where humans yeah, haven't. Yeah you know, changed it. Right. That's true. But even getting out into some of our, you know, state parks or, I mean, it's, to me, it feels there is more of an element of the wild there. And I yeah. know there's already paths, there's paths and things like that. So yeah, definitely yeah. it's, <laughs> it's not a completely wild environment, but um, it feels more to me. Right. Right. I right. just, I feel better when I'm in a place like oh, that. Oh, totally. Totally. Yep. Yeah. But I just felt like it was freeing to hear that those kinds of really wild experiences don't need to happen yeah, you know, every yeah. week or every day. But right. it can be it can be in more infrequent. And I think that was just that just gave me freedom because I was like, oh, yeah. good. I loved I loved how he talked about even, you know, people in um, a sh- uh, sh- sorry, sh- Chicago high rise, mm-hmm. if they lived near um, just a desolate uh, area. Um, were less healthy than people mm. who were living in a high rise near trees. Yeah, those people were healthier. Oh, right, 
Right. So just even just looking trees at outside your window. Yeah. Yeah. Just looking out your window and seeing nature right. is beneficial. Yeah. yeah. So it's here. It says in the book, those living in a building with a view of trees enjoyed substantially lower levels of aggression, mm-hmm. violence, reported cl- crime, along with increased effectiveness managing life issues. Oh, yeah. <gasps> That's huge. <laughs> That's yeah. really huge. Yeah. He was talking about like if you're stressed out get in nature yes if you're you know you have some sort of like if you're in the hospital if you can just get a room with a view of a park yes or something those things are going to help you physically your physical with your physical ailments totally yeah totally. and i loved how he was saying there are doctors out there who are giving park prescriptions yeah <laughs> <laughs> i want a doctor like that yeah oh my goodness seriously that is amazing yep And then at the end of each chapter, so at the end of chapter one, he has a secret for raising a wild child. And then he gives you some tips in those areas. So um, the secret number, the first secret he has is that a deep connection with nature doesn't arise only through periodic trips to national parks or other wilderness. While such trips can leave deep impressions, even more important are abundant experiences in wild or semi-wild places, typically close to home. See, we're sharing secrets with you. Even if you haven't read the book, you get the secrets. There you go. There you go. Um, so, and then he gives some nature mentoring tips for parents. Yeah. Um, one of the, so we're just going to read them. One of them is make new habits. Um, so this is all about just getting into the habit of getting outside yeah. or yeah. just creating some new rituals in your family regarding nature. Yeah. They can be very minor, very small. Minor rituals. Yeah. Yep. Um, getting out on weekends into nature. Mm-hmm. Um, so those can be bigger trips maybe yeah. i mean yep possibly because it's a weekend it can be a little bigger mm-hmm. um now for homeschoolers you know you we have an advantage that we can do that during the week too yeah um he's talking about inviting the wild into your yard with like yeah. bird feeders and bat boxes and gardens and stuff like that exactly yep Wonderful. Uh, another thing he said that i loved that caused me th- to think was make the schoolyard a classroom yeah, I know. Which he's just like, make an, make an outdoor classroom, basically. Yeah. Get stumps to yeah. sit on or whatever. Or do just do your regular stuff, like do your math outside. Outside, yep. Yep. And that's so simple. Yeah, it is. <laughs> simple, but You can just sit on your deck and do that. We could just yeah. be on our deck and do that. Right, um, right. And I, I, I loved that he made sure he said, you know, note the difference in behavior and attention span. Oh, yeah. And I have noticed that with my kids. I mean, even when they grumble, I mean, this isn't about academic work outside, but um, even if they grumble about going on a nature walk or something, it is, there is a palpable difference in um, their attitude, in their attention span, in just their look, their view on life (laughs) after we've been outside. Right. Well, he was saying, which is obvious, but I didn't think about it this way. When you're in nature, it engages most of your senses. Right. If right. it's a multi-sensory experience. Yes. Versus being inside, you might just be using your eyes or, right, your, right. or you know, outside. Yes. You're, you're feeling the wind. You're smelling smells. You're yeah. seeing all these things around you. And so it, it creates more calm. Yeah. So for someone like, say, with ADHD... Or mm-hmm. something like that. If they're out there getting all their senses used up at the same, you know, they're yeah. all engaged. That yep. is really ideal learning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's why people create fidget toys. And, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. that's why they say have, you know, some your ADHD kid like chew gum or. Right. Uh, you know, or something. I mean, those things just get taken care of when you're outside. Right. Right. All right, let's move on to chapter two, which is called The Power of Place, Discovering Nearby Nature. Yeah. I loved this chapter. I know. What stuck out to you in this chapter? Well, first of all, what I loved about it is he's talking about how powerful, you know, places and where you live. Yeah. And um, when you move around a lot, it's hard to develop a connection to a place right, right. as easily. And in our society, people move around a lot. So mm-hmm. um, what I thought of was, 
and I don't know why I haven't thought of this before. I think I have just in different a different way. But, you know, we live in Minnesota. And when you are young, like let's say a teenager, young adult, you're like, why? Why am I living here? <laughs> yeah. It's cold. It's really cold. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or at least this is what I thought. It's really cold. Why did my ancestors all settle here? You right. know, like. Why didn't everybody just up and move south? Because this right. is just un- unbearable in the winter. And why am I here? You know, and then you stay. Like You stay because <laughs> yeah. you have family here or whatever. And then I'm sure my kids will think that. Like, why didn't my parents just leave? Because this <laughs> yeah. is so cold. Yeah. Um, but I think the reason you stay is because it is the power of place. Right. It's like, yeah. this is what I'm used to seeing. It's what I love. There's so much beauty around. I mean, Minnesota is so beautiful. Yeah. It is, it is gorgeous. Yeah. And that is what I am connected to and what I have been connected to since I was a child. So that's yeah, really totally. important to me. That means something. It does mean something. Yeah. Definitely. And I think like environmentally or in, in, in a nature sense, when I think of my ancestors coming from Northern Europe, <laughs> you know, like Norway, yeah. uh, this is a lot like Norway in oh, yeah. some in some ways. I mean, there's no mountains, but I mean, it's it's a lot the same. And so I feel like when my ancestors ca- ancestors came here, they're like, "Oh, this is I can handle this. This feels like home." This, yeah, definitely. Yeah, because you can move around and you know, and be in other places, but it isn't. It just isn't the same as being home, right? In what you're used to, in what you're connecting to, and like. You know, you said that your family goes up north a lot, mm-hmm. and that is a really powerful thing to you, going to where the it, Mississippi River started. Yeah, You've been totally. there several times, and that's, you know, or going on the yeah. North Shore. A lot of people love to do that, and they feel a strong connection to that place. And yep. so, I don't know, I I had never really um, heard it put that way before, and that right. just made a lot of sense to me. That does make a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I It makes me think of a group, I think a Facebook group that I'm in and that somebody was like, I mean, and this is a national group. There are people from all over the country, actually probably the world. And they're like, we're looking f- to go on a family trip somewhere just for, you know, five days or whatever. Yeah. We don't, we're open. Where should we go? And everybody in their little corner of the world, they're like, oh, I have the per- perfect place <laughs> yeah. in my little corner of the world. And it's because we all have a, f- a favorite place in our in our we're near where we are yeah, totally. <laughs> and it is probably the ideal place to go for all of us for yeah. each of us <laughs> right and I loved that I thought that was great cool. right right yep and he was he also makes a case for how we've come away from that you know like yes. like indigenous people really had a sense of place right and where they lived yes and that and was we so don't important. so much and we don't no no because we just like oh this is too cold I think I'm gonna move or yeah. whatever you know, and I I do that. I would, I want to do that. Start looking for jobs done. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my Sean really wants to find a place yeah. warmer. He's yeah. he's not super connected to Minnesota as much as I am. Yeah. Um, for that reason, I mean, he just doesn't. Yeah, he wants a better climate, basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really loved how he talked about there's three 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 themes. Okay. That ha- that have emerged for him, he says, as being most critical in promoting nature connection. Okay. So they are experience, mentoring, and understanding. Mm. Yep. And he is going to use, he said, I'm going to use these three things so much during this book, I'm going to condense it into EMU. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to be talking about this a lot. Yep. So I loved that. I thought that was great. Experience is... Um, you know, just being out in nature, um, having a meaningful connection to nature. And that's, that's happens by getting out. You know? Right. And then he also about that, he also says, um, you know, the question is, how exactly do people form a meaningful lifelong connection with nature? It emerges organically and gradually over many years, mm-hmm. the result of a spiraling feedback loop interweaving emotions with understanding. Right, right. <gasps> so good. This is why I'm so glad I've I had people in my life who got me out into nature and yeah. and appreciated nature with me when I was a child. Now, that doesn't mean if that if that didn't happen to you, you, you know, it's not over not, for you. You're not doomed. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, um 
but I just think it makes it easier for me to, I, I think it just makes it easier for me. Well, and he's inter, he talks a lot about the emotions. And so like, yes. you know, you have a strong connection to certain places in nature because when you were a child, you have like memories and emotions attached to those places. Yes. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. The other thing he says about that, that I just love and I starred oh. is the best place to fall in love with nature is wherever you happen to be. Yes. So we do not need to spend thousands of dollars on a national road trip. Right. You know, to all the na- the national parks. Um, you can go out to your backyard. Yep. Or to yep. a city, a city park or. <laughs> right. Enjoy a tree on your block or something. Right. Right. Um, second on the list is mentoring. Which we already kind Which, of talked about. Yes, we did. <laughs> because we I got just, ahead of ourselves. <laughs> we did. But that's, I think, because we both. That really both struck us. Yep, it did. So, yeah. So, and I think he's going to talk a lot more about mentoring. Yes, in which I can't Future wait. chapters. Yep. And then the last one is... Understanding. Understanding. Yes. Um, and so this is where he talks again about... He's, he's saying, I refer not so much to the accumulation of detailed facts. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Instead, emphasis should be on understanding a few big ideas. So this is kind of like where we are in the universe, you know, like, or, you know, how the sun works yeah. in our, on our earth, you know, and, or the moon. Yep. Or those big ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. This was also really freeing to me too, because it said, you know, he was talking about how you don't have to worry about the details. Like exactly. what kinds of differentiating, differentiating the different types of trees or insects or right, right. whatever. I mean, that stuff's interesting if you want to learn it, but it's not right. the most important thing. Exactly. And once you have those big ideas, once you have a great conversation about one of those big ideas, like how many millions of miles the stars are away from us or something like that, you know, like where kids just emotionally are in awe about that kind right. of stuff, th- right. then... I feel like that's the time for them to learn more about maybe detailed facts if they want to go down those paths. But it's only they can only go down those paths if they're emotionally tied to it, I think. Right. In some way. So right. Yeah. Um anything else for you in chapter two before we get to the end of it? Um I loved how you talked about things that I don't know, come in three and he was saying, um, mm the the lesson of this great triad and i think he was talking about emotions mentoring and understanding right yep or experience experience, experience yep. mentoring and is understanding knowledge is at its best when it passes through our heads and our hearts so mm. i guess i kind of just we kind of just talked yep. about that but really it's it's worth saying again <laughs> yeah yeah um should we move on to this the second secret yes okay Secret number two for the end of chapter two for raising a wild child. He says, children will tend to value what you value. Mm -hmm. So start noticing nature yourself, taking a few minutes each day to become more aware of the other than human world around you. So good. So and then he gives tips for how to do that. Yeah. Um, One is start noticing nature. So. Yep. Straightforward. Good. Self-explanatory. Explore local nature. So. You know, that's just whatever's around your house. Just start exploring it. Right. And, you know, I think a lot of times there are things near us that we don't even know about. Oh, yeah. Nature centers. Totally. uh, Parks. uh, Yeah. Reserves, like park reserves where there's like a bog or something. You know, there are things out there that it's like there. I feel like when we go to those places, especially in the city, it's like a Mm -hmm. hidden gem. It is. Nobody goes to them as much as I feel like they They should. should. (laughs) Yeah. A lot of times I'll be driving by something and there's just a little sign. Yeah. Something, whatever, bog or whatever. And you're like, oh, what's that? Should I, I've never heard of it. Should I stop there? Yeah. And they might, they don't even necessarily have a building attached to it. It's just like a little place to hang out. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So another one is visit your local nature institutions. Mm-hmm. So that can be from the nature centers to something bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, seek out nature related media. This is good. Like nature shows. Yeah, definitely. Or like I was thinking of like the um, 
the live eagle cam that they oh, sometimes yeah. have up where yeah, yeah. yep uh, yeah. some bird is having a baby and uh is gonna the egg is egg is gonna hatch and you just watch for like three days <laughs> that's <laughs> right. always exciting to us yep yep um and then he gives us a simple activity to get started mm-hmm. if you're in nature which i really liked because it, this is i feel like this book is is approachable for me sure this is nothing huge that you need to do but here's a little simple activity you can do um so he says get out in nature f- and then find something you're interested in it could be a rock a leaf yeah you know whatever something like that and then you observe it very closely for a couple minutes mm-hmm. so you can do this with kids just observe it closely then you get a pencil and paper mm-hmm. and you draw it mm-hmm and then if you're if you have an older child, you can write something about it. And it can be a couple descriptive words. It can be a poem. It can be any any little writing. Yes. And then you share it with right. everybody. Exactly. So he's and then he he condensed it down. He's like, this is really easy. Observe, draw, write, share. Yeah. Easy enough. That does not take planning. No. <laughs> Which is a huge bonus for me. Yeah. I mean, you do need a piece of paper and a pencil, but other than that, it should, it should be pretty easy. Else. It's not a huge drawing. It's not doesn't have to be a correct drawing. No, nope. the word it doesn't have to be a lot of words. It can it's be... just sharing what you're observing about your item. It can take ten minutes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I loved that. I loved it too. Yeah. This was yeah. So I was won over by this by the oh, first good. two chapters. Good. I really was. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. I'm really inspired too. So I'm, it makes me excited to get out and try some of this with our yeah, kids. Yeah. Yeah. What does he say on the dinosaur train? <laughs> I don't watch that show. Go out and get into nature. Oh yeah. I have heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> anyway, it's been years. We haven't watched that for a long time. Yeah. But yeah. All right. Let's move on to loving this week. Yes, Angela, what are you loving this week? Okay, I am loving a podcast, which nice. we may have talked about before, about season one, but I'm loving season two. Oh, great. Um, In the Dark. Oh, right. Have you I've listened heard. to season two? No, I haven't. Okay. But I heard, heard it's or... better almost than oh, the first yeah. one. So I heard about this from Jamie Golden at I the know. podcast, and when she said she loved it as much or better than season one... I was how intrigued. could you? I was like, you were like, I have got to listen, and so I, I kind of like, I didn't save it up, but I was eagerly anticipating binging the whole season. <laughs> yeah. Um. So season one, it's it's okay. So it's it's sort of a true crime podcast, but I don't even like to say that because if you're not into true crime, then you're just gonna stay away. Mm-hmm. But I don't think you should stay away because it's more about like, you know, criminal justice systems. Oh and yeah. How they're yep. working or not. Yeah. So season one was about the Jacob Wetterling case, and that's a Minnesota case that you and I grew up with. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And so so that's why I listened to that, because I was like, oh, it's about Jacob Wetterling. And it was so good. And it mm-hmm. was basically about how um, the local sheriff's department and police departments kind of screwed it up, mm-hmm. basically. Yep. Um, and it was just fascinating, because I didn't know like how all these systems work together. It was really interesting. Right. So season two is about the case of this man, Curtis Flowers, who is a black man living in Mississippi, I think. Okay. And um, he gets charged with murdering four people. Okay. And he's been in prison for 21 years for these murders. Okay. And um, he's basically... And he's been tried six times oh for the goodness. same murders. <gasps> You can't do which that. Which sounds, I know, it sounds like you can't do that, but you can. Oh my gosh. Because he appeals it. So like the first one oh. he was charged and then he appealed it and then he gets another trial because they found out, oh, there was some, you know, like More the evidence. DA did some wrong, did some stuff wrong. Oh, right. So, okay, now you get to do it again. Same DA does, a, misses it oh. up again. <laughs> so this has happened six times. Um, so it's it's about like race and the criminal justice system in the South. And this is happening right now. Like, yeah. Yeah. Corruption is happening right now. And it's interesting, makes me angry. Ugh. And I'm just like, I don't know, I'm hooked. And it's still going on. So like, um, you know, it's not over. So yeah. now now that I've binged up 
up to the certain point. Now I have to yeah. wait one, every week for a new episode. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, but really, really good. It's it's almost better than the first season. Do you, like how many how many more episodes left do you think? I think I'm on episode seven, and I don't know how many more. I don't even know how many oh are going to be. Ugh. It's a good one. It reminded me of. There's a book I loved that I was my loving this week. I don't know, maybe a month ago. Okay. Um, by Brian Stevenson called Just Mercy. Mm-hmm. Um, which is also about race and the criminal justice system. Really good book if you haven't read that book. Okay. Or listened to it. I highly recommend it. Um, so it kind of reminded me of that. Okay. It's just stuff that like, is this, can this really happen? <laughs> I know. My eyes really are opening. I, wow. My eyes are opening to the fact that this stuff This happens. is happening. So, oh. yeah. Yeah. Anyway, okay. so I would recommend that. Maren, okay. what are you, what are you loving this week? I'm loving a new t-shirt. Oh, okay. For the summer. Um, uh, it is called, it's, the brand name is Prana and oh, it's yeah. called Foundation V-neck Top. Mm. Which is surprising. You're probably like, Marin, a V-neck? Yeah, I love V-necks, so I'm writing this down. Yeah, and <laughs> I don't normally. Yeah, are you wearing it right now? No. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm wearing my pajamas right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> um, no, so this is, it's a V-neck, but it's such a slight V-neck. And it doesn't oh, go yeah. down. It's not like this big scooping yeah v okay so it feels more just like a, a uh, detail yes exactly yeah yeah and it's very it's very lightweight okay and it's um very i don't want to say flowy because it's not like it's super <laughs> flowy but it's just not like tight it's not like right. a fitted t-shirt yeah it just feels like it just like hangs very nicely oh nice i know the only thing is so it's kind of expensive it's prana, yeah. you know. So I got it at REI. Okay. Um, with my twenty percent off coupon. Did you go in the store or you're going I online? I went in the store. <laughs> oh, wow. Because I was desperate one day for t-shirts, and so I went and got one for twenty percent off. But then, because I loved it so much, I more. paid full price for another one. <laughs> uh, and then where did you did you get the second one on at online? REI oh yeah, totally online. <laughs> i'm gonna have to see it when yeah i see you yeah it's just a very plain t-shirt i know but, but that's it's just what i need how it feels it yeah. feels so good yeah nice yeah i love it uh well thank you everybody for listening you can find us on social media we are at facebook and instagram at homeschool unrefined we also have a closed facebook group called unrefined homeschoolers and mm -hmm. the conversation is really picking up in there so we'd yeah, love to have you join fun. us. Um, and you can also go to our website, homeschoolunrefined.com, where you can find links to everything that we talked about. So we will see you next week. Thanks for listening. Homeschool Unrefined was created by Marin Gorse and Angela Sizer. Thanks to Gambler's Daughter for providing the music for our show. You can find Gambler's Daughter at facebook.com slash gamblersdaughtermusic.